to you. And it is all through you. In Jesus' name. We come, oh God, before you with thanksgiving, laying everything at your feet, bringing you our very best. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he. Sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat.
we thank you that you change not. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We love you. We adore you.
heavens and the earth, the omnipotent one, almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing. We honor you, oh God. We bring you our best. We don't bring you our leftovers. We honor you with all that is within us. We come into, we've come, we have come into your gates with thanksgiving. We have come, we have come into your courts with praise. We love and adore you. You are wonderful. You are mighty. And you are close. Ever close. praise. Not your neighbors, your praise. Shout that out to him. Speak that out. Ever how you choose to worship and praise him. Now, some of us get a little louder than others. There's nothing wrong with that. Some are quiet. That's okay. But you give him your praise, your thanks. Amen? Because he is faithful. He loves you. We're excited to gather here today to worship the Lord and, and get a word from the Lord today. I believe that he has a word for each one of us. Do you believe that? Uh, pray for your ears to be open. No distractions. Because he has a word. I believe that he'll bring us a word. That'll encourage you. It'll help you walk through this week. It'll help you say something to someone else. Uh, courage to speak to someone else. We're going to worship the Lord in our giving today. We're excited about that because today is, is missions. Our offerings will be going for missions. Amen. We're going to give to Peru missions, Columbia missions, and local missions. And then we're going to bring the tithes and the alms in. And, and of course, we know about that, but you pray about the alms. How, how, can, how can you give? It doesn't have to be a lot. It could be a lot. He may ask you for a lot. He may ask you for a little. But that will help someone else when there's a, a need that arises. But uh, We want to pray first for our pastors and churches in Peru and in the mission in Colombia. And we have Sister Lena with us today. So be sure and speak to her today and, and, and encourage her. We're, we're excited about this. Anytime we can help someone else. And we have our local missions, which is uh, what we do out of the local church here. Helping Helping our church family, but also helping families in the neighborhood and our camp. We have This is camp season, uh, so that's gearing up here. You'll see that in your bulletin. And you pray about that. How can I help a camper? How can I sponsor a camper that God may change their life? Those are, I've, I've worked in those camps for many years. Uh, never was uh, privileged to be a camper I was too old <laughs> but I was able to volunteer and work in those camps and it's a tremendous blessing you know to watch those kids and serve those kids and, and get in the worship so you pray about that uh, you can read out on out in the foyer what it costs to uh, sponsor a camper you may be able to do part of that but you pray about that that is a tremendous blessing for you if you will help that child be able to go to camp and be changed. Father, we love you. We praise you this morning as we gather. Uh, it's so good to see each one. God, we lift up those pastors in Peru. Uh, Pastor John, as he kind of heads those up, and all the churches there uh, today, God, we pray blessings over them, uh, spiritual growth as they reach out and, and train and try to reach people in their community. And we pray for the Columbia Mission of this Sister Lena and the children there, God, that those needs can be met. Those needs, spiritual needs and physical needs can be met. And the same here in our community in Elizabethtown, God, that we can meet spiritual needs and physical needs also. Those are important also, God. Help us to be a, a people that 
looks out and reaches out to that. And God, we thank you for Bethesda, such a giving heart, a giving heart of people, God. It's because we love you, God. We love you first. And in turn, you touch our hearts and speak to us. And we are gladly to share what we have with others because we know who our provider is. It's our Father in heaven. God, we pray your blessings today upon these offerings, upon the church, in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. It's good to have everybody here. Isn't the Lord good? Has He blessed you this week? It's a blessing just to have the opportunity to serve the Lord. Amen? Just to be able to serve God. To wake up every day knowing that it's His breath that we breathe. It's his life that we can represent. It's important. Uh, just a quick announcement here. Um, we will not be having the gifts class today due to so many being gone. Um, but we are rescheduling the gift class to the 25th of June at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So if you did not sign up, please sign up on there so we know who's all going to be there. Some of you that were in the class, you need to take the gifts class. If you've been here already, you haven't taken the gifts class, or maybe you just need a refresher, sign up for that gifts class. It's going to help you to, to discover what it is that God has for you to do in your life. How many of you know we all have gifts? We all have talents. But sometimes we just don't know what they are. And we bury it, things. We think we're too young or we think we're too old. We're not too old and we're not too young. Amen? Praise the Lord. Let's all stand and let's go around, high five, fist bump, hug somebody, greet, meet and greet. Let somebody know you're glad they're here today.
just one word you calm the storm that surrounds me just one word the darkness has to retreat just one touch I feel the presence of heaven just one touch my eyes were open to see my heart can't help but believe you there's nothing that our god can't do there's not a mountain that he can't move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our god can't do just one word you heal what's broken every dream just one touch I feel the power of heaven just one touch my eyes were open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that I can't do there's not a mountain that he can't move or oh, praise There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. And there's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like Praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing, there's nothing that Jesus can do. I know there's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Oh. you today. Lord, we give you thanks. We want to lift up the name of Jesus. Lord, you said if you would be lifted up, you would draw all men unto yourself. 
Lord, you said that for us to let our light shine before men that they could see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. You said to us, you are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill, it cannot be hid. You said that you were the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by you. You said, Lord, that you're the door, the entranceway to the King's throne. You said, Lord, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, we confess today, not just with our mouths, but Lord, we want to confess with our hearts that you are the Lord of lords and the King of kings, that there is none like you, O God. We cast everything at your feet because we recognize that we are nothing and you are everything. Lord, we bless you today and we celebrate you. We give you all the glory, all the praise, all the worship. Our eyes are fixed on you, O oh Lord. For you are the maker of heaven and earth. And we bow our hearts before you and worship. And we give you thanks and praise. And everybody said amen. 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 Christianity versus the kingdom of God. Today, today the church preaches a different Jesus. Today the church preaches a different gospel. Today the church preaches a different Holy Spirit. We stand here in opposition to Christianity. Somebody after last week said to me, so you think that you and Bethesda have everything all together? And I said, you've not been listening. The indictment is against all, not just one place. But I believe the Lord has begun to deal with us and speak with us that we need to get back on track and preach the correct gospel. And we need to represent the right Jesus. And we need to exhibit the right Holy Spirit. That we do not need to flow with the path that's out there today in the religious sector that we live in. If we would be alive today and Jesus and the disciples would come here, they would be rebuking us for our religiosity. They would be rebuking us for our mediocrity and they would be, Jesus would be rebuking us because we praise him with our lips, but our hearts are far from him. You say, how do you know that? Because we have very little fruit to show. Come on. Think about Christianity today. If you just thought about it in the United States of America, do you know that we are down to about 18% of the people in the United States of America attend church on any kind of regular basis? Do you know we're about, we were at 80 some percent, which we knew that was a lie, but now we're down to about 60% of people who even profess to be a Christian or know God. There's a reason for that church. Hello? There's a reason for that. Because the church has hid its light under a bushel. The church has hid itself away to a place to where people do not recognize 
when we talk about the gospel. The church has relegated the gospel into just the good news. How many of you know we believe the gospel is good news? People preach today the gospel is just about Jesus Christ being born of a virgin. They preach that the gospel is just about Jesus Christ living on this earth and about him being crucified. That the gospel is just about him being raised from the dead. How many of you know we believe that that is a part of the gospel? I mean, you can't get no better good, no, no better good news than that. Right? Anybody in here thankful Jesus was born? Anybody in here thankful that he died? Anybody in here thankful that he rose from the dead? Anybody in here thankful that Jesus said to Nicodemus, Hey, Nicodemus, you can't enter, you can't see into the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Anybody in here glad that he said you can be born again? Woo! That was kind of weak. Yeah, man, I'm thankful that now... I'm back to what we originally were supposed to be. Did you know that's what we're talking about here? The, the, the initial establishing of the kingdom of God was in, not it, it was first and foremost heaven, the eternal realm. You know, God created everything that's in the eternal realm. All the angels, all the cherubims, all the seraphims, all the sons of God, everything that's in heaven, God created that before there ever was any planet, stars, or moon, or, or sun. Sometimes we don't think about that. We think about, okay, he had a throne, there were some angels there, and that's it. But man, it's a kingdom. It's a realm. It's real. Do you know there's three worlds? There's the heavenly world, the heavenly realm. There's the earthly world, the earthly realm. And then there is a world beneath the earth. I believe there is something functioning in the, in the depths of the earth called hell. Kingdom, another kingdom, and it's called the kingdom of darkness. One of these days, the Bible says, in the last three and a half years of what's going to take place in that seven year period the first three and a half years is going to be tribulation period i'm going to tell you something tribulation is not for the ain'ts it's for the saints we're going to have an initial catching away of the man child those who have made themselves ready but those that have been standing over here and just doing a jig and carrying on and living like you know they're they're in some kind of passive thing they're not going to make it in the first round Three and a half years of tribulation to get all the rest of us ready who didn't get ready to begin with. Because we were sold a bill of goods by the Christian church that says all you have to worry about, all you got to be concerned about is being born again. If you're born again, woo, you're going to escape this mess. Well, if only being born again was enough, he wouldn't have said, make yourself ready. We were ready when we were born again. Guess what? We'd have been like, we'd have been like Enoch. He, we just would have been with God and we would have not have been because we would have been perfect. How many of you know being born again did not make you perfect? Being born again did not make you mature. Going to church did not make you per does not make you perfect. Going to church does not make you mature. Paying your tithes, giving your offerings. Serving around here does not make you perfect or mature. We have to lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us. Man, it is an ongoing process, but that's a part of the kingdom of God's message, the gospel of the kingdom that the church today leaves out. I mean, let's face it, man, we are reducing, we are reducing the need for us to be together. I indict the church today that we, what, what started out in the spirit, we're trying to finish in the flesh. Paul writes to Galatians there in the passage of scripture we used last week in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 and 8, and he talks about that. Verse 6 through 12, he says, I marvel, I marvel. It's a marvel to me that you are so soon removed. 
You're turning away so soon to the calling of the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and they want you and to, they want to pervert you, the gospel of Christ. But he says, if an angel or one of us come along and preach to you any other gospel than that which we have preached to you, let them be accursed. I'm telling you today, the church is operating under a curse. Now, we don't have to operate under no curse. Jesus Christ came, died for us, and took away all the curses. How many of you know we don't have to sit here and worry about some generational curse? If you've been born again, I'm going to tell you right now, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Don't hold on to this any longer. You cast it out of your head. If you've been born again, you do not have to sit here and say, well, I'm the way I am because of a generational thing in my family. That's hogwash. Put that under your feet. Jesus died that you don't have to be in bondage. The church goes around and preaches this, oh, bless your heart. This is the way you are because of what your mama did. This is the way you are because of what your daddy did. This is the way you are because of your history. No, Jesus said, if a man is born again, he is a new creation. Did you hear me? He is a new creation. Old things are gone. They're not going. They're gone. The writer writes and he says this. At one time, man, we were whoremongers. At one time, we were idolaters. At one time, we were adulterers. But hallelujah, glory to God. Now, I've been justified. Now, I've been saved. I've been sanctified. I've been cleansed. I am no longer those things. Why? Because the blood of Jesus has washed me whiter than snow. Oh, there was a day you'd preach that and people would shout, jump, holler, scream. Woo! Now it's like, yeah, woo, <laughs> But listen, curse is broken. Huh? No demon has control of my life. Did you hear me? No devil, but here's what we do. Listen, he set you free from all that. Whom the Son sets free, come on. Man, when I was 18 years old in 1978, at Larkwood Church got a prophecy. I went down to an altar, spent about a couple hours there praying, people praying for me and all that kind of stuff. I want you to know when I got up from there, I was washed whiter than snow. I was cleansed. By the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, no more sin stains. My past was gone. And then came December, January, February, 1979, 1989, whatever in the world it all was. It all came. And guess what we do? Guess what the church has done? We pick back up curses. We pick back up stuff. Hello? And, and you know what the church has done? Church has preached the message. Oh, 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 hear all you mothers. Oh, bless your heart. Don't worry about it because none of us are perfect. You know what that is? That's just an excuse that... Hey, I sin. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Woo, can't say nothing to you because I don't know how to live either. Now, do we know that when we sin, God's grace is sufficient? The Bible says the grace of God covers a multitude of sins. I'm having to do that because I don't want nobody leaving here saying that I'm not preaching the whole gospel. I'm not saying that the grace of God does not cover a multitude of sins. It does. It covers our sins from the past, the present, and the future. But I want to tell you something, that's not no license for us to live like the devil right now. Amen. That's no license for us to be excused because we're falling short. People fall short, what do we say? Oh, Beth, don't worry about it. Everybody falls short. Well, we all fall short. Anybody in here fell short this week? 
Anybody in here had a bad attitude? Anybody ever here had worry, anxiety? Anybody in here worried or doubted or feared? I'm, that's falling short. You may not went out here and killed somebody. You may not went out here and robbed somebody. You may not went out here and committed adultery this week. But I'm going to tell you something. Man, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. I am not yet where I want to be. But I'm not wanting you to come up behind me and say, Woohoo, it's all right. It's okay that you went over there and threatened that guy to cut his head off. He shouldn't have cut you off in traffic. Oh, it's all right that, it's all right that you, you weren't thinking and you gave that guy the silver salute. Or you walked up and you, you, you cussed at him because, man, he scared you half to death. God understands all that. Yeah, God understands all that, all right? He understands I sinned. But what, sh what should happen when we do find ourselves falling short? We should be convicted by the convictor, the governor, the Holy Spirit, and we should cry out to God, forgive me, Lord. Why? Because when we don't, we're cut off from his presence. And we open the door up for more. And so what the church has done, the church has picked back up the curse of the law because Paul also said to the Galatians, who hath bewitched you, Galatians chapter 3, who hath bewitched you, O foolish Galatians, that you would try to start in the spirit, but you're trying to finish it in the flesh. That's what I want to say to us. Who, who hath bewitched you? into thinking you can start in the Spirit. The Spirit draws you. You receive Christ into your life. He opens the door for you to enter the kingdom, and then you try to continue on by living the law. The law didn't save anyone and can't save anyone. You try to live it by walking in false doctrine and error. And traditions of men you try to walk it out by taking on this mindset of religiosity that the world or the church has because the church is not to conform to the image of the world but the church is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind God help us I once was, now I am no longer, but in order to stay that way, I have to stay in a life of repentance, come on, anybody know repentance, raise your hand, wave it like this, repentance, church that's a foreign word to us, repentance, you know what, repentance is not just saying I'm sorry, some of you folks don't know that because you've never been in discipleship once. Repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is not, not just some act you do. Hello? Repentance, repentance is turning away from what you did and going in a different direction. And you're getting your eyes off of all this with a changed mindset. And you're fixing your eyes on God. Who not only is he powerful enough to save you, he's powerful enough to keep you. Because if we keep our eyes on God, what does it say? He who keeps his eyes on him, he keeps you in perfect peace. So we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, if you do that, that's not just once. Yes, 65 years ago, I confessed with my mouth and believed in my heart the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, okay, but your actions don't back that up. You know why? Because that believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth is an ongoing thing. The more I confess him, the more I believe in my heart. What does he say? He says, when you do that, he says, you, 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 he said, I believe, therefore I speak. I believe in my heart, so I confess. 
I believe in my heart, so I walk. It's not just, it's not just saying I believe. It's not just saying I confess. Because if you confess and you believe in your heart, you're going to also do. See, that, that's, that's another foreign thing to the church anymore. The church is foreign to covenant, commitment, faithfulness. Fella, if I, hey, I'm, I was there on Sunday. I don't have to go to home group. I don't have to go to first church. I don't have to go to no classes. I was there on Sunday. I want you to know if you only come here on Sunday, you are immature. If you only participate in church one time a week for a couple hours, well, here it might be two and a half. You are immature. My son Derek told me, but Dad, I'm 18 now. I'm 18 now, and I decided that all I got to do is go on Sunday morning. I don't have to go to youth. I don't have to. And I said, I said, Derek, I'm going to tell you something. Listen, there is nobody ever who went to church on Sunday morning ever got to maturity. It's not the kind of maturity the Bible is talking about. In the scripture, the Bible says if we're not equipped, if we're not equipped, and that equipping, when is, how, somebody in here tell me, how long does discipleship go? Till what now, what now? We die, or fly. we die or fly. And apparently we've not flown yet because we're here. A while ago I was going back. I need to try to get some date set with Stephen on the, on the class. And I'm going back. I saw him standing by the booth. I get around the corner. I look over. He's gone. That fast. And I thought to myself, uh-uh. He ain't the only one in this place that went in a rapture. <laughs> and he had knelt down over there and I found him. Thank God. I mean, not that he was left here, but. Till we die or fly. Man, there is no age limit. Come on. There is, it, it's not, it, it's, it's like somebody asked this morning out there, how old do you have to be to go to the school of ministry? As, as soon as you can take it. As soon as you're old enough to do the work. As soon as you're old enough to keep up. As soon as you're old enough to do it, you can be in it. You don't have to, don't matter if you're 15. Doesn't matter if you're 14. Whenever you're old enough to do it. Because we should be discipling everybody. Hey, when is it time for me just to sit down and let all the other people do it? There is no time. People said, oh, you're 63 now. Woo, you only got four more years, you retire. Don't hold your breath that you think you're getting rid of me in four more years to no dumb thing called retirement. I'm here till I die or fly. Hello. Why? Because you don't retire from the work of the Lord. I taught Sunday school all my life. Yeah, well, keep on teaching. I did all these things. I served. Keep on serving. You see, that's another thing that's wrong with the church. We have salvation without any works. The church is preaching a false doctrine. I don't work to stay saved. I work because I serve him. I love him. I care for him. And one of the things the church doesn't preach anymore is servanthood. Well, I just don't have that gift, Pastor Jerry. I don't have that servant gift. Well, you're not saved. Did you hear me? Somebody said, man, you preached hard last week. Three quarters of the church is missing. Well, I'm going to see if I can't go for the other three quarters. <laughs> Did you hear me? I'm telling you the truth this morning. I'm, I'm trying to help us. If you don't have a heart to serve, you haven't got saved. You're not born again. Because born again, being saved, is, servant, a servant is not a gift. A servant is a way of life. The Bible said, let you that are born again, let this same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robber to be equal with God, but put on himself the form of a servant. Man, if Jesus came here to serve, don't you think when Jesus gets in me, I'm going to want to serve? I'm going to want to work. I'm going to want to do, not because I have to in order to be saved, but because I want to. want to because I want to be like Jesus right I want to be like Jesus man I don't have to always have my feet washed I like to wash other people's feet 
my brother came over this week, this weekend, stay with us again. Uh, I think I, I think I might have a hook in one jaw and a hook in the other. I'm, now I'm going to get right into the tongue and pull. But he was joking with me, in, I think. Um, but he came over yesterday because we cooked out last night while he was here. And he said to me, he, something we were talking about something, and he made this comment. It's all about you. It's all about you. And I said, yeah, it's all about me. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Joking. But I tell you what, that's how a lot of Christians live. Huh? It's, it's, about how, it's, it's the way a lot of Christians live. It's all about me. It's all about my stuff. It's all about my problems, about my issues, about this, about that. And then most of the time, the people that are like that, that don't have a servant mentality, they're not out to serve. They're not out to help. They're not out to do. They're the ones that are having the most issues. I tell you what, when you, when you take up your cross and follow him, which he says, if you're going to be my disciples, you have to do this. You have to deny yourself first. You have to take up your cross and follow me daily. When he's talking about taking up that cross, that's what he's talking about. You, in the form of a servant, you're not living for yourself anymore. Christians don't live for themselves. Christians live their lives for others. Others have a need, and Christians respond. Come on. They're not sitting there saying, well, she whiz, if I do that, that's going to inconvenience me. That's going to be a real hardship. They don't, Christians don't think about that. Christians just say, hey, brother, you need me? Okay, I can, I'll help you out. I'll do it. I can be there. Hey, brother, you're putting up a fence. You don't know what the heck you're doing? Guess what? All of us come over and help you put that fence up. Huh? Hey, you got this going on? Guess what? We'll come over and help. We'll come over and clean up around your house. We'll, do, we'll help you out if you really need it. Parents, if they really needed it, if they really needed it, some parents take advantage of it because they think, well, someone's not got their camp paid. I guess mine ought to get my camp paid. No, it's for people who don't have any money to send their kids to camp. If, they, if the church didn't help them, their kids would not be able to go. It's not for people whose kids could go, but I just don't want to spend the money. Hello? The church helps out kids that they could not go if we did not help them. But because we're so used to taking, and not serving, we take advantage. I'll tell you what. You probably don't feel it right now, but this is good preaching. I, I, I tell you what, I indict Christianity because we do not preach the divine power of the blood of Jesus. We have watered it down to where we do not believe anymore the blood will never lose its power. Because I'm going to tell you what. When somebody gets washed in the blood, their lives change. Huh? Their desires change. Nowadays, nowadays because the watered-down grace and the watered-down message that the church is preaching, people can say, I confess my sins, I give my heart to Jesus, I pray the prayer, and still live the same old way they were. Same old attitude. They're still snotty. They're still nasty in their spirit. You know a person cannot be a Christian unless you're a prodigal and be mean-spirited? Huh? Come on, somebody shout, praise the Lord. You can't be that. You can have a bad day, you can have a bad week, but you can't have a bad life and be a Christian. I can make a calendar of how many bad days people are going to have. I'm just going to tell you right now, listen, I told, I told Pastor Doug Spainhauer the other day, we were in my office, we were going over things. I said, I, I, I just don't understand. I said, because I don't live my life in anxiety. I don't live my life in drama, except for the drama that I counsel. 
I, I don't live a personal life in drama and all that kind of stuff. I don't do it. Now, I've, I've had bad days. I've had bad weeks. I've had bad months. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But, but I'm going to tell you what. We don't have a bunch of drama. She tells me what to do, and I do it. <laughs> it's drama-free, Maggie. She says, go over there and jump. And all I say is, how high? No drama. She says, get your act together. I say, put the list together. I'll start working on them. And she says, I'll give you the first five. <laughs> she must, you must, you and I must be related. But listen, listen, I want to tell you something. When Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords in your life, all of that passes away. And the only way you're still having it is if you're trying to live a double-minded life. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Come on, church. God doesn't want us to be double-minded. Oh, Pastor Jerry, God understands. He does. He does. The church today, Christianity, is in a real fix. Because we are decreasing, not increasing. We are having a great falling away. Did you hear me? We're falling away from the truth. We're compromising. We're losing faith. People are losing their hope and their faith. People don't have the word to go to and trust anymore because too many pulpit preachers are preaching that the word of God's not infallible. I can't trust it so I don't study it. No, listen to me. Listen to me. I said last week, you can trust the word of God. The same Holy Spirit that gave men anointing to write it is the same Holy Spirit that keeps it intact. I don't care what, I don't care what some educated idiot says. My Holy Spirit, he's all powerful. Come on. I indict the church this morning because we are not preaching and teaching the fruit of the Spirit. How many people in here you would say you've been born again? Lift your hand. Okay, all of you that didn't, there's going to be an altar time. And Jesus is calling. You say, what do you mean? Well, one of the evidences that Christ lives in me is the fruit of the Spirit. Did you hear me? Huh? There's, there's, two, there's two evidences that I think that people are looked to to find out if you're born again. The first evidence, the first evidence is the desire, hunger, passion for this. If, you, if, you, if you've been a Christian for a while and you don't no longer have a hunger and a passion for this, guess what? You're a prodigal in the hog pen somewhere. Something's not right. You don't, you, this don't go away. A child that's born, first thing it wants to do is eat. It's hunting. The doctor, hel nurse helps you. They help that baby. Here, here, come on, do this, do this. And all you got to do, you help that baby a little bit. Just like when newborn babes in Christ are born, guess what we do? We help. Here's how you can eat. Here's discipleship. Here's how you can be trained. Here's how you be equipped. And we come along. But I'm going to tell you what, pretty soon, pretty soon, nobody has to touch that baby's head. Nobody has to tell that baby squat. That baby's after it. And when he gets done with the one, he ain't finished yet. He's going over to the other. And then pretty soon, guess what? You put a bowl of cereal on his plate, guess what he does? He takes his hand, he gets it in it, and he starts shoveling in his mouth. But it don't stop there. Pretty soon, they're eating other stuff like bread. They're eating other stuff like little bitsy pieces of meat. They're doing other stuff. But as they get older, like this, 
You got to get a hold of them and say, dude, stop. Somebody else wants to eat. Because, because we grow up liking to eat food, don't we? Well, he says just like it is, just like it is with a newborn babe that desires its mother's milk, a newborn babe in Christ desires, has a passion for, hungers after the sincere milk of the word. How many appreciate the milk? But you know what? I, I indict the church because the church is not taking people from milk to meat. Some of you all, some of you all are still sucking on the bottle. If you don't think you're still sucking on the bottle, come and meet with the elders and we'll sit down with you, do about a 50 question test or something and we'll, we'll show you how little you may know. But babies aren't happy. They, they, if they're healthy, they're not happy with just milk. Why? Because they don't grow. They don't mature. They don't get where they need to get to. And the, and the writer of Hebrews said it in Hebrews chapter 5, 12 and following. He said, when you ought to be teachers, you still have need for milk. Why? Because strong meat belongs to the, to the mature who have handled the word of God properly. And they hunger for the word, the meat, so that they'll be able to discern good from evil. How many of you can see that the church doesn't have much discernment? We jump on every new fad. We go with every new little thing. We, we do stuff extra biblical. Come on. You say, oh, Pastor Jerry, I don't believe that. Let's look at some of the move of gods that we have supposedly had over the last 25 years. Let's just take a couple for example. Let's take the vineyard movement at the airport vineyard church in Canada. Where Holy Spirit was supposedly moving. And I want you to know that I do not think that there was no fruit out of that at all. But I'm going to tell you what. It was, it was extra biblical. It was wacko. And then we as churches tried to duplicate it. Now, you may not even know what I'm talking about. But me and a, my, my spiritual father went up to Canada to see what this was all about. We walked into the place, and there was people everywhere. And they had little guys in these shirts that were ushers and, and watching out, so, supposedly. And we're walking along, and this was a big old building that had um, posts, pillars up and all over the building to hold it up. And I'm walking along, and all of a sudden, I see somebody down on all fours, and they're barking. And I'm like, what in the world? And they go over to this post, and they're looking up, and they're growling and barking at the post. And I said to the guy in the shirt, I said, hey, 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 excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. What is that? What are they doing? He goes, is, your, is this your first time here? I said, yes, sir. He said, you've not been in a revival like this before? I said, no. <laughs> I said, I've been a part of Pentecostal movement. I've seen some whacked out things, but I've never seen that. Now I'm in a charismatic revival, and I don't know. I, I don't know about this. That, looks, that, that to me is like what a coon dog does. He said, he said yeah. He said, he said, what they're doing is they're treeing the devil. <laughs> treeing the devil. Treeing the devil. Well, I don't want to tree no devil. I want to cast the devil out. Huh? Silly stuff. You know, we went through another, went through another aspect of that same type of revival and, and, and more than that, where preachers would get in a pulpit and they'd laugh for 35, 45 minutes. Just laugh away. And then somebody else out here, because you know laughter is contagious. And if I start laughing today, you'd probably be going, he's crazy. And then pretty soon you'd probably start going, ha, ha, oh man. He laughed. It's called the laughing revival. That's what it was. The joy of the Lord is being restored. 
Well, I'm going to tell you what, when we are sitting in the place to where we see so much rampant sin and things in the church, the way we do the shortcoming of the church, the lack of power, lack of authority, the last thing that we need to be doing is laughing the service away. The church needs to repent and get the real joy of the Lord. Do you know the real joy of the Lord, the fruit of the Spirit? That's the second thing you need to look at. If your life's not bringing forth the fruit of the Spirit, then you may not be born again. One of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. But when he's talking about joy, he's not talking about an emotional thing. Hello? He's not talking about an emotional thing because if it's an emotional thing, it can move as the wind moves. Some of y'all be real happy today and look like you're about ready to jump off a bridge tomorrow. It's not emotional. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is not emotional. Can be. You know that we can have, I, I can get the joy of the Lord, can bust out of me, and I could start laughing. But it's not an emotional thing. If it's emotional, it can change. But the fruit of the Spirit, and the church is not preaching it this way, is a supernatural thing. It's not measured by my wisdom. It's not measured by my knowledge. It's not measured by my emotion. It's not affected by the winds and the waves that come in our lives. Man, the fruit of the Spirit is steady and steadily increasing in our lives. So that we are becoming more and more like Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith. We should have love, joy. Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All those things out of Galatians should fill our lives. So that we can be a light and a witness to those that are around us. Self-control. Huh? Man, we get, we get tore up and aggravated over the silliest stuff. And we whine and we grumble and we complain. Come on. We lose it when we should just be saying, in the name of Jesus, God, give me strength, help me. This ain't the end of the day, this ain't the end of the week, this ain't the end of the month, I'm going to be all right. And, and walk through it with the peace of God and the joy of the Lord. I indict Christianity because Christianity acts like the world. We, we turn church into a social club. Man, the church should be a help center, an equipping center, a place where people come and they get ministered to and they get needs met and they understand more and they walk out full of faith and power to do what God wants them to do during the week. Church is a filling station where you have gone out and you have given, 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 and now you've come back in and you want to fill up. But because the church doesn't know about servanthood, the church does not understand authority, the church does not know about team, we go out of here and we come back and we just pile on what we've already got because we haven't given anything away. Church has become mediocre because now everything about a lot of times church is about accommodating people's schedules. And their lifestyle. Hello? Well, I got news for you. That's not what we should be about. People should accommodate their lifestyle and their schedule to the kingdom of God. It shouldn't be a thing of, well, I'll be there if I have time and I'm not busy at this. Oh, no, you should be there, and if you have time, then you do that. My grandson's down visiting us, and Trita said, oh, we're only going to get to see him today because he's going to camp. He's not going to get to stay a week with us like he used to. So I'd like to go do something with him. He wants to eat at Mr. Gaddy's, and he wants to eat at uh, uh, the Chinese place. I don't know how I'm going to pull both off, but we're going to go to the Chinese place. Trita said, I'd like to do something else with you. She goes, you know what? Right down from the Chinese place is an arcade that they opened up. Maybe we can take him there. But, but I didn't take him this morning at 8 o'clock or 9 or 10 or 11 because if I have time to do that, I'm going to do that. I want to be there with him. I want to be there. But I'm not going to replace that with this, for this. 
if I had a class this afternoon, I would have to squeeze in and get it in there somewhere where we could do that. Let's have church on Saturday night because now we have soccer on Sunday. No, 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 no. Man, train your kids that this is more important. I know that people don't like that. But it's the truth. The more you teach your kids that there's other things more important than this, more important than gathering together, more important than discipleship, more important than that, those worldly things that are, that are privileges anyway... The less and less they're going to want this or feel like they need this. Jesus said the Spirit of the Lord was upon him because God had called him to break the bonds of affliction, to set the captives free, to loosen the chains, open prison doors. Today, though, people come into church bound, tormented, sick, and lame, and if it gets too stirred up we take them to another room to minister to them or we sign them up for counseling thinking that maybe we can counsel it away or we send them to the doctor no offense we send them to the doctor to get a diagnosis of a sickness of a disease of an issue a lot of times we send them there before we have even prayed for them. We suggest the medicine cabinet before we ever lay hands and ask God to heal them in the name of Jesus. We are all guilty. I'm not preaching to any one person in this church. I'm preaching to all of us because we all do it. We have a little cold. We have a little thing. Instead of getting with Jesus and weathering it out, we try to go find somebody to prescribe us an antibiotic. Somebody's having issues. Somebody's, some kid's having some issues. We automatically, man, they've got an attention deficit disorder. We need to drug that. No, you know what we need to do most of the time? We need to cast the spirit off of them. We need to understand the spirit of infirmity. We need to understand, man, this is a place of deliverance. This is a place of power. But because we've watered down everything, this is a place that doesn't have power. We got to send them someplace that they can get help. You know I'm telling you the truth, because when you compare us with the New Testament church, we're lacking. When you weigh us in the balance, we're coming up short. But I, I want I want you to know I'm saying this today, and I'm preaching this because the church is indicted because the church no longer believes. Even in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they've watered it down to where it's not necessary. They've mistaken the gift for the gifts. And they, they, they try to tie the gifts in with the gift. And you can't do that. God wants us to be filled to overflowing. And he just doesn't want us to be filled once. He wants us to be continuously being filled. God wants us to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And you shall receive power after And you'll be witnesses of me. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You'll be a light. And these signs, come on, these signs shall follow those who believe. How many of you know these signs? Cast out devils. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Preach the gospel. Speak with tongues. These signs will follow. And these works that I have done, you shall do greater works. Come on, church. Listen. Listen. You can't drug a spirit. You can't scream at him loud enough. You have to be prayed up, fasted up, and filled up. And when you are, you don't got to get up there and jump up and down 100,000 times screaming and yelling. And some, Hey, seven of y'all, hold them. I, didn't, I don't see nowhere where Jesus said, okay, you 12 disciples, get over there and grab that guy and hold on to him while I cast the devil out of him. 
He just walks up. Matter of fact, Jesus didn't even have to do anything hardly. He walked up. They started talking to him. No, no, Jesus! Isn't that the way it ought to be? No, Beth, no, no, no! But, I mean, we walk up to them, and we're there. Come out! Right now! Can somebody else come pray? I'm tired. And we think, we think if, we, if we have enough manifestation. How many of you know that demon possession is real? Hell, heaven, real. Hell is not a figment of your imagination or just some story. Hell is real. People that are not born again, they're going to hell. Torment forever. I don't care what churches preach. I don't care what your pastor says if you're somewhere else. I don't care what in the world you've heard all your life. I want you to know something right now. If you are not born again, you will not go to heaven. You will not spend eternity with Jesus. There is a place that you're going to go. Not because God hates you, but because you rejected Jesus. Not because you got issues, not because you got problems, but because you did not get born again. Today in the church, we don't even, we don't even talk about it. I, I played for us one Easter. I did this last Easter too. But quite a few years ago, I played the clip from passion of Christ I you, you don't know it well, maybe you do because maybe somebody told you but but I got attacked not by the world by church people that was in this church they attacked me for showing something so graphic well I'm gonna tell you what that's just a little bit of what Jesus went through for you and me. You ought to be able to sit there and t- you ought to be tore up. You ought to be man, oh man, just like they were then when they stood there by and watched it. You should have noticed the demon that was walking in the background because that's what was going on right there. Deception and filth was going on right there. You should be able to see it, but not us Christians because we want everything to be decent and not challenging. That's why, that's why people told me when we ministered a few times and had people that had spirits and we cast those spirits out in this church, at this altar, they came to me afterwards and said, you know what, I think there ought to be a different night that we do that. I think there ought to be a different night that you come to church here. I, I, I mean, serious. That's the attitude that we have in the church today. I'm telling you, the church is backslid. The church has walked away from Jesus. The church needs to be indicted that we are not walking out the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not living in it. But there's something that you can do about it. You can fall on your face and repent and turn from our ways and say, Jesus, restore in me a right spirit. Fill me up, God. I don't want to be mediocre. I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to be religious. I don't want to rest on my past. I do not want to be associated with Christianity today. Because it is watered down to where today anybody can call themselves a Christian and not even change. Huh? When Jesus gets a hold of your life, you want to lay aside those things, even those things that might be lawful. Somebody comes to me and says, hey, if I drink a glass of wine, will I go to hell? I'll say no. You won't go to hell. The Bible says drunkards. Drunkards won't enter in. But what I can tell you is flee temptation. Don't let your good be evil spoken of. Give no place to the devil. You don't need it. Don't do it. Don't mess with it. Leave it alone. Get away from it. Because all it destroys. You can handle it, but your kids coming along under you might not be able to, and they may be alcoholics all their life. Why would you want to do that? Stay away from it. Because even though something might be lawful for me, it don't need to be there, some of it. He says, lay those things aside. Don't live the same as you live. When you're born again, you want to do what's right. 
Even when you stumble, you cry out to God, save me, Lord, help me, Lord, deliver me, God. Don't let me walk this way again. And we've all been there. But I don't want to stay there. I don't want to live there. I don't want a lifestyle of there. Come on. Bethesda is not going to be like that by the grace of God. By the grace of God. By the grace of God. I am going to change. By the grace of God, I'm not going to walk in confusion. By the grace of God, I'm not going to sit around not able to finish anything. By the grace of God, I'm not going to sit around and not be able to accomplish what God's got for my life. By the grace of God, I'm not going to sit around and say, well, I just don't know. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to know. I'm going to know what my gift is. I'm going to know what my calling is. I'm going to know what it is. And I'm going to do it by the grace of God. Because the devil's the author of confusion. The devil's the one who wants to keep you from your destiny, not God. God's called you. God's gifted you. God's gave you talents to do what? To use those in the kingdom of our God. So the world can see Jesus. Amen. Stand with me this morning. This is the day. If you're struggling with anything that I've said, this is the day of our salvation. If you've truly been born again and you're struggling, the Holy Spirit's convicting your life. If you're in a situation that you shouldn't be in, the Holy Spirit's convicting your life right now, convicting your heart. He's wanting to change your heart, change your mind to where you want to do the will of God. He has called us to do the will of the Father. It's not a suggestion. It's a mandate. He's called us to be filled, to be endued with power. That's not a suggestion. That's a mandate. That's a command of Christ. The church today is a prodigal church preaching a false doctrine because they don't believe that anymore. I'm telling you what, it's not changed. Now, I believe the the Pentecostal church and the charismatic church has done a lot of damage to people's lives because they have made the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit to be a three-ring circus. I want you to know I believe in manifestations. The eldership of, the, uh, of this church believes in manifestations. The Holy Spirit can do what he wants to, but when he manifests, he produces fruit. Hello? He just don't manifest on you and then you walk out and continue to do the same stupid stuff you were doing before. You're convicted. He's changing you. I've, I, I watched people during these revivals we're talking about. I watched people lay on the floor, seriously. I watched them lay on the floor for hours. As one of their elders, as one of the pastors in the church, I watched them lay on the floor for hours. I watched them get up out of the floor after hours of being laying on the floor, t- saying they were doing carpet time with Jesus. Get up, walk out of the church, and the next week still be acting the same old stupid way. I, I, I can't believe that if I spent two hours in the presence of God, having me and Jesus time, that I'd get up and be the same Dumbo I was before I went down there. Huh? I believe he changed me somehow, some way, some form, some fashion. He had me down on that carpet for a reason, and it wasn't just to blow bubbles. It wasn't just to play board games. It was for a reason. It's because Jerry Westerfield had some stains and some junk and some stuff that he wanted to bring up into my life so that I could lay them aside, not play with them, 
Not act like I'm super spiritual because I spent two hours in the floor with Jesus. I spend hours with Jesus every day, but it don't make me no better than anybody else. It just means he's working on me. What is it, church? What is it, Bethesda? Do we want to sit around and just be content with being like everybody else? I want you to know as long as you come here, we're not going to be concerned with what time it is. We're not going to stay here just to be doing it. But man, this is too important to pass by. A couple hours in church is not too long. I know, I know there's places you can go and get in and out in an hour and ten minutes, five minutes. Man, if that's what you're after, go for it. But here, man, we're going to get a hold of Jesus some way, somehow. Even if we, like last week, all the leadership was here all day. We never left. All of our leadership, some almost 50 people were here all day long. Had lunch, then we had a vision meeting. I gave them again what I gave us on Sunday morning. And then we all stuck around for prayer at 5 o'clock. I was here from 8.30 in the morning until, until 8 o'clock, 8.30 I finished up. Got to sit down, took my shoes off and went. <sighs> and 20 minutes I sleep. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what, listen, this is how I feel about it. This is how I feel about it. It was a good day. It was a good day. Man, we need more days like that. Where are you at? Are you going to continue to let the devil push you around? Or are you going to stand up and stand strong and look the devil in the eye and say, not me. I'm falling on my face before Jesus and I'm going to do what he says. No matter what the cost is, no matter what the unpopularity is, I'm going to do what Jesus says. I'm going to be what Jesus wants me to be. If that's you today, if that's you today, Step out from where you're at. Come forward. Raise up your hands unto the Lord. Cry out to God. God, here I am in all my weaknesses. I yield to you because when I'm weak, you are strong. Right now, from all over this building, if that's you today, come forward. Lift up your hands unto the Lord. Cry out to God if you need to for forgiveness. Let the grace of God that passes all understanding saturate your heart. Change us, O oh God. Change us, O oh God. Change us, O oh God. Exalted one, Jesus, your name is like a honey on my lips. Oh, yeah. 